Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you, whether it's morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you're listening to this. My name is Steve Henson, and I'm a local resident here in the Andover, Ohio area in Ashtabula County. I happen to own some property right along the lake, Lake Pima Tuning, which is what we're going to talk about. And that property uh, is in a housing development. And about eight years ago, uh, we had a uh, meeting of a uh, committee and they said, gee, we're coming up on the 75th year anniversary. We need to do something about the, uh, talking about the property. And I said, well, who knows about the property? And it didn't seem like anyone knew anything at all about how the property got there and its relationship to the lake and those kinds of things. So uh, being retired and not having a lot of things to do, uh, I started investigating uh, the background of Pima Tuning Lake. Not so much the building of the lake, because there's a lot of information available on that, but really the whole story behind the lake and the, the area around the lake. So we're going to go begin the story uh, back about uh, 35,000 years ago in the prehistory of the area. And during that period of time, the glaciers were covering most of the eastern part of the United States, at least down through the New York area into New Jersey and all the way west across the United States. And this was called the, the Wisconsin uh, Ice Age. And if you were here in Andover at that point in time, of course Andover wasn't here, you would look up, and if you couldn't look up because you would be in ice, there would be about a mile to a mile and a half of ice above you. So the ice was very, very thick during that period of time. Over time, the glaciers started to melt and they started to recede. And in this picture, you see a glacier and in front of that glacier, you happen to see trees. And in front of those trees, you will also see two people standing on a walkway. Now this glacier is in, in fact receding, but you can see that as that glacier recedes, it recedes over a long period of time and trees begin to grow up. And so in the area, the Andover area, that's what happened as that glacier receded. The trees began to grow up. There were more and more trees. The trees died. They fell over and over thousands and thousands of years. It created an area which was very swampy. Trees fell across streams, built up, they deteriorated. And so it wound up with being a, a lot of swamp area here in this area. So we'll kind of move on tens of thousands of years here, and we'll, we'll talk about the Beringer Migration, and everyone relates to the Beringer Migration as the period of time when people from the Asian continent came across to the northern part of what's now the United States and, and Canada. And that migration occurred over thousands of years. They came in to North America, they spread out going south to South America, they came across uh, the America to uh, the southeastern part of the United States before the United States. And uh, they also came across uh, the Canadian area to the east. And so the, the first people that we know of that were in this area were in fact the mound builders. Now we all relate to the mound builders in the southern part of Ohio. But um, at that point in time, there were mound builders here. And in fact, in the area where the lake's at, there were three mounds that were in that lake. Now, of course, in this day and age, um, if we were to run into one of those mounds out there, everything would stop, the work would stop, and the archeologists would come in and they would start doing excavations and take a look in those mounds and see what was there and perhaps move any any bodies that might happen to be there. But back, uh, back when the lake was put in place in the 1930s, that was not the case. So, uh, but there were three mounds that were in the lake. We kind of fast forward again in time uh, to around the year uh, 1000 to 1850. And that point in time, we begin to see the uh, Indians and the Indian names that we have become familiar with in our study of history, uh, the Lenny Lenape, who were the Delaware, uh, and the Seneca, uh, who were uh, the Iroquois Indians 
were in this area during that period of time all the way up to, and they were here until 1850 after the white man had come. Um, the settlers in this area, the Andover area, started appearing around 1802, 1803. Other parts of Ohio had been settled at that point in time. So in the 1860s, uh, after the Civil War, uh, there was a, a lot of interest in draining the swamp. Uh, it was an agricultural economy at that point in time, and farmers wanted to have more land to farm. Certainly the swampy area, once it was drained, would provide extremely good and fertile swamp, uh, ex extremely good and fertile land to be able to farm. And so the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, which is where most of the swamp was at, put together a program and uh, did a study to determine whether or not drainage would be possible. And they did confirm that. They, they came up with a plan of being able to drain the swamp. But as uh, politics go of the, the time, there was no real interest in putting forth the money in order to be able to do that. So as a result, nothing was really done uh, during the 1860s relative to draining the swamp. Industry arrived in the area uh, in the 18, late 1800s, mostly in the form of steel mills along the Shenango River and all of the other supporting companies that were coming in at that point in time. So the industry in the area began to grow. One of the issues that they ran into, most of these steel mills and companies were along the Shenango River, and they had to deal with a lot of flooding that came along, as well as drought. Uh, back in that time period, we did not have the EPA, and they dumped their raw affluent into the Shenango River. And when the Shenango River dried up, it would smell, and the people in the area did not like the smells very well. And so those were the issues during that period of time. About 1907, uh, there was PA legislation to uh, do a study and to build a reservoir. And now this is the flip side of draining the swamp. And of course, now we have a competition going on between the farmers in the area and the steel mills and companies down the Shenango River. So the industries were pushing for more water to keep those streams moving and to uh, allow their affluent and everything to flow on down the river. And as a result of that study, there was a confirmation that, yep, you can, in fact, build a dam and uh, dam it back up and build a reservoir and control that water as it's going down. And so a decision was made then to build a dam. And uh, we have some pictures here. The first picture is depicting the flood of 1913 of the Shenango River uh, in Sharon, Pennsylvania. The water rose to a little bit above the first floor level, first story level in the buildings in Sharon, Pennsylvania. And there were, was over $3 million of damage. Now, it's quite a bit of damage back in that day and age. And there were certainly lives that were lost during that flood. And so the legislature got together, and this time they said, okay, we're going to approve some money. So they approved $1.2 million. The only problem is, is that by the time it got to the governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, that got cut to $100,000. So they really didn't have a, enough money to be able to move forward. So over the next ensuing years, there were additional floods that came. And finally, in 1917, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania enacted additional legislation, putting forth $700,000. The only problem that they had was as part of that reservoir was going to be in Ohio. Now, how do you deal with that? You just, you just can't go buy a section of Ohio and put your lake in. So they kind of hemmed and hawed uh, for a few years. And of course, in 1917, we're now in the midst of World War I. And there are all of those issues with dealing with war, which were a lot more higher priority than determining whether we're going to put a lake in. In 1918, towards the end of the war, uh, the steel companies along the Shenango River decided that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania 
really wasn't going to uh, move forward with this like because of the Ohio situation. And so they got together and they started purchasing land in 1919 in Ohio. They pooled all of their money together and in 1919, they began purchasing the land in Ohio. And we're gonna get into that land in a, in a little bit. And at, in 1920, they formed the Pima Tuning Land Company. And the purpose of that Pima Tuning Land Company then was to take care of all the issues associated with the paying of taxes on that land and those kinds of things that they were going to have to do until the lake got built. So we now have private ownership of the land in Ohio. So at this point in time, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the land itself and what happened with the land. In this picture, um, we have an overview of an area, uh, which those of you who live in this area can will be familiar with it. This is what is now we know as the causeway that goes across the lake. This is Lake Road that comes down across Marvin and Slater and Gibbs Roads. And then it makes a left-hand turn, goes down to uh, the Haynes Marina down there and the Duck and Drake down in this corner, and then it goes on down to Winfield. So that's, that's sort of uh, where you're at in this picture. And so back uh, in 1919 and 1920, there's a lot of land that's going to be purchased. Now, the problem is, okay, what land are you going to purchase? Well, this is a contour map. Typical contour map, this is not exactly to scale, but it'll, it'll put forth the idea for you of what happened. They came in and they said, if we build a dam and it fills up with, fills up with water in the reservoir, that water is going to fill up to about the 1,012 foot level. And so the Pima Tuning Land Company came to Ohio and they asked the surveyor to do a survey of all of the land that was east of this road where the lake was going to be so that they knew exactly where all the pinpoints and stakes were at and to make sure that they knew where this 1,012 foot level was at. So I'm gonna remove the other contour lines here and simplify our, our map a little bit. This is the 1,012 foot line. Uh, you see that there are some truncated pyramids over on this side. Literally at one point in time, there were big stone truncated pyramids that stood about four or five foot high all along the Ohio, Pennsylvania line. And so those were easy to find during that day and age because it was pretty much farmland and it was pretty much barren. So in the next slide, I put in some uh, farmers here. We got farmers A, B, C, D, and so on down through there, kind of shaded in where the lake's going to be. And so now the Pima Tuning Land Company needs to buy land uh, along this uh, 1,012 foot line. And they come in and survey and they put in straight lines so that the water, straight lines where the water will not be going past those straight lines to kind of demark where they needed to buy land to. And in the next slide, we're going to start talking about the farmers who were selling their land. And this was Farmer A up here. And Farmer A decided, you know, he says, if you're going to buy this much of buy land, I don't have very much land left to farm. And so if you're going to buy it, you've got to buy it all. And so the Pima Tuning Land Company came in to buy that land. They bought all the land where the lake was at, and then they also bought the rest of that farmer's land, which they didn't really need. But then again, the farmer couldn't farm. So we'll go on down to uh, the next couple of farmers, B and C. And as I've indicated here, they said, well, you know, we, we really still have plenty of land to farm. Uh, maybe they had some other land in other places, and so we, we still have land to farm. We'll be happy to sell you this land here. So they sold land right along the edge of the lake, again, on a, on a straight line basis, coming, coming down uh, for the property line. And so as we come on down, uh, you can, you can see there were some farmers that sold, there were some farmers that didn't sell, and some farmers wound up having land along the lake. 
what happens ultimately with that land is the green that's shown here ultimately becomes a Plymouth State Park after the lake has been built. And we'll get into that a little bit more later on. There are also some land that was right up against the lake. Those turned into uh, allotments, what we call allotments here in Andover, which are housing developments, but they were primarily established for people who wanted to come out and spend the weekends and spend the summertime here. They were recreational property. If you can imagine the sale of recreational property back in the 1930s. So the green again becomes ultimately the state park. And there are also some businesses like the Haynes Marina down here uh, and Bayshore, which is, a, which is a campground, as well as the state park campground. So that's kind of what happened to that land uh, later on uh, when the lake was finally put in. Now, to these farmers, they got some benefits with this land. The first thing was is they were allowed to continue to farm that land, even though they had sold it, up until they were notified that they no longer could, could uh, farm it. So remember, the sale of land occurred in 1919-1920. They actually kept that land until about 1932 and farmed it and have received the benefit of a payment for that land also. They also were not required to pay any taxes. The Climate Tuning Land Company in the agreement said that they would pay the taxes on that land. So the farmer now gets his land and he gets it tax free for the period of time that he's going to be there. And so the last thing that the farmers got was the benefit of having access to the lake. And again, a little bit later on, we'll see in 1935 where there's an easement given to those farmers for them to have access to the lake. There were some interesting things in the deeds that went along with the sale of this property. Uh, there was one deed uh, which had a, gave the right to have a boathouse and a boat. Now this was long before the lake. The owner knew what was going to happen with the property. It was going to go into that. So he owned that property down near the lake. He wanted the right to be able to have a boathouse and a boat down there. We know this today as Haynes Marine, Haynes Marina, uh, which is down near the Dock of the Great. Uh, the other thing was, is there was one parcel of land where the gentleman decided or the farmer decided he was willing to sell the land, and that was no problem, but he wanted to reserve the oil and gas rights, and so they allowed him to retain the, the oil and gas rights. So somewhere down here, the oil and gas rights underneath the lake still belong to the heirs and the signs uh, of that particular farmer. Don't know that that will ever happen, but uh, that was what was one of the deeds, one of the notable deeds. Okay. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about boating and motors. Uh, this is one of the issues that has always come up on this lake. Uh, there is a problem between the people who want uh, the, now all of the natural things, the wildlife, uh, those kinds of things. They want it to be pristine in nature as, as a lake. And on the other side, you have the boaters, you have the recreationalists who who want to have bigger engines and bigger motors on the lake. Um, they want to be able to go out and ski and do those kinds of things. So there's always been a conflict between them. There were actually no motors, all rowboats. And if you remember from 1936 when the lake opened until 1945. Uh, so nine years went by before there were any motors that were allowed on the lake. And yes, there were motors back during that an age. Uh, in July of 1945, President Harry Truman signed into law the use of a six horsepower motor up to the causeway. So at that point in time, motors could only be used south of the causeway. In August of 1961, President Kennedy then signed the six horsepower motor, uh, which allowed it to go all the way to the dam. 
Uh, and so uh, here we have a, another president. Uh, as you can imagine, presidents signing into law uh, the size of motors to be used on a lake. Uh, that's the kinds of things I guess presidents do. Typically, you find these, this legislation attached to other bills that are going through. And so they're one of those things that get thrown in with a much, much larger bill that's getting signed. Okay, 1964, President Johnson, this is three years later, signed into law the 10 horsepower motor, which uh, we, we used to call the 9.9 .9 horsepower motor. Uh, and it was signed into law in 1964. And that pretty much stayed uh, the same until 2008 when we had President Bush sign into law the 20 horsepower motor, which went all the way from the dam all the way up to where the ducks walk on the fish in Lyonsville. Okay, so that's a little bit about the lake, uh, its history from back during the days when there was a, a glacier here all the way up to the, the current day, at least the 19 the 2000s uh, with the with the motors. Uh, I hope it gives you a better understanding of all of the things and the issues that were associated with the lake and the building of the lake. Again, not so much the actual building of the lake, but the the issues that came in as a result of the farmers having their lands uh, bought out and um, that land then allowing uh, access then to the lake that became places where people had residential areas and, and they have access to the lake through those residential areas. So that's pretty much an overview of the lake uh, as I have seen it. It's been nice to have been with you and I'm very happy to have made this presentation to you. Thank you.